to help clients avoid tax pitfalls. So without further ado, Steve Parrish. Thank you much, Brent. Uh, you know what I got out of that introduction? You made me hungry. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, it's nice to be here. Uh, for I had the same count that you did as uh, my sixth uh, BUI presentation, but I'm not there uh, enjoying the, the meal and the uh, fellowship. Um, and I do want to thank, as always, Principal Financial Group for sponsoring this, because that's what we've done all along. Uh, I have a slight prejudice uh, in favor of Principal Financial. I was with them for 17 years, and Michelle and I have known each other for over 20 years. So uh, thanks again for sponsoring this. And, and one final thanks is uh, to the audience for uh, attending. We have over 100 people here. Uh, I saw uh, Bobby Samuelson last month uh, for the BUI seminar, and that's a tough act to follow. Uh, but I want to assure you of something. You know, if, if you're on the ropes as to whether to listen to this webinar or not, because the nice thing is you can always just you know, exit and leave, I want to assure you that this is really not yet another tax attorney uh, providing a, you know, a lecture as to what the, the, these proposed tax laws are, are saying. Now, I, I want to cover that a little bit, but as the title says, well, what I'm really trying to do and what we thought uh, would help with BUI and, and all of you is be more focused on guiding, um, guiding your clients in light of this proposed legislation that we're talking about. Why me? Well, uh, apparently I'm an expert. <laughs> and That sounds egotistical, but let me give you where I'm going. Edwin Meese wants to find an expert as someone who comes from more than uh, 50 miles away show slides and isn't responsible for anything they say, well, that makes me an expert because unless you're listening to this from Des Moines, Iowa, uh, you're more than 50 miles away and I'm showing slides. And this third one, uh, this slide tells you that I'm not responsible for anything I say. So I can, I can just go forward with that. Okay, so given that, let's, let's talk about where we're gonna go with this is what I wanna do is talk about where we are with taxes and then, um, so we will spend a little bit of that just kind of reviewing, making sure we know what's being talked about, but then really get into planning, how to incorporate what's going on out there, which is the most confusing time as a tax lawyer I've ever had to deal with. And I'm sure Brian feels the same way because we just don't know where to go with all this. And then talk about strategies and some ideas to consider and primarily in the area of life insurance. So uh, let's get started with where we are in taxes. And I came up with this recently, and I still think it's a, a decent analogy as to using traffic lights. So think about this. You know, if you have a green light, that means you can proceed, right? You're good to go. If you have a red light, that means you have to stop. You really can't go forward. And then if you have a yellow light, that means caution and maybe you can proceed, maybe you can't proceed depending on what's going on. Well, I think that analogy works in talking about what's going on right now with legislation. And frankly, I think you could almost use it with your clients because we do have some green signals of law that is good to go and we can move forward. So you know the SECURE Act is out there. That's not something that's gonna happen. It's something that, that happened in late 2019. We had this new IRS publication that confused us all, but still lets us know what we can do. And so that's there. There's also these new IRS life expectancy tables, and um, we'll talk about it a little bit later, but basically these are new life expectancy tables that are black letter law from the IRS that we use for um, figuring out life expectancy starting next year, January 1. We have the section 7702 amendments in the tax law that dealt with life insurance. So we know all these insurance companies that are out there scrambling. Um, I mean, this is good news, but Congress passed it and the insurance companies are pricing some of their products to deal with it. That's, that's black letter law again. And remember, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act sunset provisions are the law. So it basically says that come 2026, uh, the exemption for estate tax purposes cuts in half. And we return to those uh, Obama year uh, income tax rates at 39.6. That's not a maybe, that is a, it, it will happen unless Congress actually passes a law to change that. And we know how successful Congress has been lately in passing legislation. So that's kind of green law, green light stuff you can go forward on. I just want to point out there's some things uh, that are red lights where you see them out there, but you can kind of know that you can move forward. So as an example, just to give you two on kind of both sides of the aisle, 
One is the wealth tax, that the idea that Senator uh, Warren has come up with the, that basically taxes wealth, it gets talked about as a constitutional and all that, but it's, it's not going anywhere. And we also have in the uh, farm states, um, and this is actually a, um, both parties have, some people have signed on to this idea of actually reducing the federal estate tax rate in half. So instead of 40%, 20%, but we know with where Congress is right now and who's president, that's not gonna happen. So the real question is what puts us in the, the caution in the yellow uh, light area? And that's in, um, there's discussion going on in all three of the big areas, income taxes, estate and gift taxes, and even payroll taxes because of the social security trust fund issues that are going on. So let's, we'll just kind of quickly review this without getting into whether it's Sanders or Van Halen or the Green Book from Biden. But basically in the area of income tax, we know that there is a move to bring the tax brackets back up from 37 to 39.6 um, and not wait until 2026 for that to happen. Uh, we've lived with that before. It's really this next one that's the big one is um, one of the ways that's being discussed to pay for infrastructure issues is to bring capital gains over $1 million up to the regular rate. So that's 39.6. But if you're going to have capital gains over $1 million, you obviously are also going to have the net investment income. So you really got to add in 3.8%. So you're talking about capital gains over 40% out. And then the other two big ones is an estate planner that's just I didn't think it could ever happen. And now, you know, it may not happen, but it very well could happen too, is to have carryover of basis um, at death. I never thought that might happen, but there seems to be some serious discussion. And not only that, but go with the Canadian model, where essentially not only does the basis of a item of an asset carry over, but also it gets taxed. The capital gain hits at death over a certain amount. So those are the income tax ones that are going on. Um, I'm not saying they're happening, but they, I'm saying they, they really are ones you have to pay attention to. Um, and then there's other ones which I'm not going to go through in detail, but these are the ones that are kind of what I would call below the fold, where it doesn't hit all the headlines, but this is the stuff that really can hurt because they might cap itemized deductions only up to the 28% tax bracket. They might bring back that P's limitation, which really means that your itemized deductions just kind of go away. Um, and they, um, they might even limit how much, and this would apply to some many of you, I would guess, if you have pass-through organizations, they might phase out how much of that 20% deduction you can get for your QBI um, if you make too much income. So I'm just saying, you know, those aren't being talked about a lot, but those ones can really hit you. What about a state and gift? Well, we've all heard that they like to bring down the exemption. Uh, in Sanders' bill, he's talked about actually bringing it down to $1 million for gifts and $3.5 million for a state. I'm not saying that's where it's going to end up, but I mean, the 3.5 is kind of a bogey that people are talking about. Changing the rate so it's not just the flat 40%. It could, for billionaires, go all the way up to 65%. But I think the one that is really worth keeping an eye on is the strategies that would be curtailed or eliminated. And there's not much talk about that. But again, as a planner, these are the ones that we really uh, need to keep an eye on because they affect the kind of planning we're doing. They would essentially just take the fun out of grats. They might still exist, but you would have to have a 10-year grad or something like that. It would have to be um, the value of the gift would have to be at least 25% of the asset. It just kind of takes out the takes the air out of that balloon. Um, essentially, eliminating grant or trust in the sense that right now you can pay the income tax at the donor level, but keep it out of the estate. They basically would say, no, you got to have both. And then one that really kind of scares me in the terms of life insurance is the discussion about limiting the annual exclusion to, uh, to $30,000. That would have severe and immediate effects on funding irrevocable life insurance trusts. Again, not saying it's gonna happen, but I'm also saying that's out there. And these are the kind of things that could pay, possibly slip in a revenue bill where people say, oh, we didn't raise the rates, but oh, we just took care of some things uh, with rich people uh, that were just uh, you know, loopholes. So you worry about it. Finally, in the area of payroll tax, 
Um, we don't have any really solid proposals, but candidate Biden had talked about this and everybody is aware as we come out of the COVID-19 crisis that um, social security is underfunded. And in a decade essentially um, could run out of, um, out of the trust fund. So we have to somehow bolster that uh, to build it back up. And there's been discussion about one idea where you might continue to have FICA just up to the normal uh, wage gap, you know, 138,000 or whatever it is right now. And then you wouldn't pay any FICA until your income goes above 400,000. And then you'd kick that payroll tax back in. That's being talked about, being discussed. Um, it's a possibility. And then just other cautions. Um, Brian, you were mentioning this as we were getting ready for this, the whole idea of um, what's going to happen. Are, are they going to get mad at each other and then just use reconciliation to pass some of this? The big fear is uh, retroactivity. Now, um, that has happened before. So you can say, oh, it's not constitutional. But I have seen retroactive um, tax law come in in the past in the Van Halen amendment um, basically suggests come, going back to January 1st of this year. Uh, the Democrats have talked about wanting, if you know, if we're going to do all this, we want restoration of the SALT deduction so that maybe we get rid of that $10,000 limit on um, state and local taxes. And then the whole thing in the business area, which we're not going to talk about today, but you know, um, they were talking about bringing up the, the C Corp taxation from 21 up to 27%. I don't know if that has legs, but they're talking about it. But also Secretary um, Yalen has talked about this whole idea of a 15% minimum tax. So all I can say is those are other cautions to be aware of is, as you're starting to look at all this. So it really comes down to that's kind of where we are. Don't ask me, is it going to happen or not? Because um, I, you know, my crystal ball is just as broken as everybody else's is. And anybody says they know, um, I, I just ignore that and move on. So let's use our time to talk about how to plan with this. How do you incorporate some of these tax issues, either the green light ones where we can go ahead or the yellow ones where we say, well, we don't know, let's, let's proceed with caution, if you will. Okay, let me give you some general planning considerations. And then at the end, I wanna give you a few specific planning considerations. Um, just generally, you need to stay up on this. Even though uh, the, the stuff that's yellow is not tax law yet, you need to be up on it because first of all, there may be some opportunities and we're gonna talk about some of the things you could do now, even though there's not black letter law on it yet. And you know your clients are reading about this. And they might act precipitously and think that something is a done deal. You need to be up on this so you can work with your clients and help them, which leads to the next point. Uh, being your buddy uh, with your client doesn't always work. In this kind of area where we're really talking about serious issues and financial consequences of proposed taxes, you want to be their advisor rather than just somebody who agrees with them. So if they don't like the current president and Congress, fine, but you still have to deal with what's being proposed. It, it works both ways. I saw people um, during that didn't think the tax cuts and job acts would happen. It just wouldn't happen. Well, you need to be their advisor. So I just want to point that out because these are tricky times. I have a question and I have no answer, uh, but you know, with all that's going on for you, with the BI, you know, the best interest uh, at the SEC level and NAIC and local states, do you have a duty to disclose what's going on with taxes to your clients? So if you present an idea, do you have a duty to disclose to say, well, this may change based on what's being proposed? I don't know the answer to that, but I would I'd, I'd put that in the back of your mind and think about it because whether you act or delay is a tough question. The trouble is, and this is just driving attorneys crazy because they clearly have fiduciary liability on their recommendations. They're, they're really having a tough time because you look at the Sanders bill and say, man, you better get some of those assets out of the estate now and do grants and do all these wonderful things. But you look at the Van Halen amendment and that goes back to January 1. So you just moved up your taxation. So none of us know how to deal with that, which leads to the last point is whatever you do, you want to document it. I really, really mean these, there's opportunities, but it also means a lot of danger from a liability standpoint. So you really want to document where you are. Okay, that's some general planning um, thoughts. 
let's let's look into um, where we go from here. What what areas are being affected? Well, really, from a financial standpoint, all areas could be affected by the things I just brought up: financial planning, estate planning, retirement planning, and obviously insurance planning. So what I'm going to do is look at it through the lens of insurance planning. But a lot of what we're talking about are the kind of considerations you want to have if you're a financial planner or estate planner, whatever. So I thought this might uh, help as a way of putting this all into perspective and why these uh, proposed changes are a, a big deal. Let's think about how you get taxed. During life, you, know, you, you take your wages or your savings and that kind of thing and they're subject to ordinary income tax. And right now they're, the max is at 37%, but it could go up to 39 and a half. Or you have capital assets where essentially you buy the, the, you know, the magic stock and really nothing happens as far as tax. So you don't market to market. You basically don't have to pay any tax until there's a realized event. And then the maximum capital gain is 20%. But again, they're looking at bringing it up to the 39.6. And again, you have the net investment income uh, for higher income people of 3.8%. Then you have a lot of opportunities that are tax deferred. So you have IRAs, you have annuities, you have life insurance, and each one of them have their own tax. But once they're taxable, they're taxable at the 37%. But the timing's different. Like um, with an IRA, once you take any of that, that's immediate taxation versus if you take out annuities, a single premium immediate annuity over a period of time, you do have the, the tax advantage of paying that 30% prorated over your life expectancy. And then life insurance, as long as the policy doesn't lapse, you can get at those cash values on a first in, first out basis. So you have that. And then there are some tax-free things, not a lot, but you think about municipals and Roth IRAs. All right, how do you get taxed at death? People don't always think about IRD, income in respect of a decedent, but the basic deal is to the extent you have things like IRAs or salary that hasn't been paid or deferred compensation, that's income in respect of a decedent. And until it is distributed out to beneficiaries, it's actually taxed at the estate level and the estate level works like trusts. And so they have these compressed brackets, meaning you're paying at the 37% level shortly after $13,000 of income. So your taxes really tend to go up. And when we're talking about affluent people, these estates don't always close right away. So there's some additional tax. Well, capital gains. Okay, as I said, you don't pay tax on capital gains until there's a realized event. Well, if you didn't do anything with that asset until you die, it steps up in basis. So it's a freebie. So it's essentially like a zero tax on that capital gain. That's a great thing. Um, and then what about the tax deferred tools like, uh, you know, IRAs, inherited IRAs? Well, basically they're tax deferred, but the deal is you, they get accelerated in how the beneficiary takes it. And especially because of the SECURE Act, essentially you have to take it within 10 years. I mean, that's the basic rule if you're a, a non-eligible uh, beneficiary. And then you have tax-free things. What are they? Roth IRAs and life insurance. Okay, so let's use an example, and especially in light of the fact that the uh, principal is um, working with business owners, and um, that was my area, by the way, was business owners. So we always work with business owners, but I decided I'm going to make uh, Tony a business owner. So everything I'm talking about is a business owner, we're good. And what we're going to talk about is he is uh, an individual who owns this business, he uh, has a wife, he has adult children um, that he loves, and um, he is willing to put some money aside each year uh, in savings. And it's going to be $14,600. Uh, I'll tell you why. And for purposes of figuring out kind of to get apples to apples, we're going to assume he earns 3.75% on um, these assets before tax. And if you're wondering why is that's because um, those were the numbers that Michelle at uh, principal gave me. Basically, a $14,600 uh, uh, premium 
for a $1 million guaranteed UL. So what you can see is I'm kind of setting this up for purposes of comparison. So thinking about how Tony could get taxed, first of all, he could take that money and put it in some kind of vehicle where he's getting a 3.75% and he'd be paying, again, I said he's in the top tax bracket, so he's paying uh, tax at 37%. Well, essentially, and I'll show you a graph of this next, but if he just kept paying that, you know, pay as you go and getting 3.75 when, um, uh, he's not really going to have a new tax at death because he's been paying tax as you go along. At his life expectancy, he will have built up $722,000. It's a nice nest egg. But what if he could magically, with each one of those $14,600 cash flows, buy a capital asset, meaning, you know, kind of buy the magic stock that um, he's not going to sell until later on. So it's really zero tax. And let's say that he just holds on to it until death. Well, the nice thing is, again, he gets a basis step up at death. And so if he took each one of those 14 six and had a capital asset, he gets a, a freebie at um, when he dies. And so now he'd have one million um, eighty thousand dollars, you know, a lot more money. And my point in, in just showing you this example is that's a third higher than if he pays his tax as you go. So even though it's the same money and the same tax rate and the same uh, rate of return because of, of where his asset location is, it makes a difference. So scenario three says, uh oh, they changed the law. And so now the basis is going to carry over. Well, if we actually had it uh, carry over and get taxed at his death at the 20% current uh, cap gain rate, and you have to add the 3.8% in because that would apply. If he died at life expectancy, instead of a million, he basically have 844,000 because it's gonna get taxed. So his family gets less. And if um, the Biden Green Book got its way and actually got the capital gain over a million dollars again, um, taxed at the full 40% plus the, the 3.8, um, then, if he died at life expectancy, it's down to 750,000. So see what I'm getting at is if you're gonna tax all this stuff at death, even if it were a capital asset, um, it's there wouldn't be a lot uh, more, 750,000 versus 722,000 if you just put it in a bank account at 3.75. Well, what else could he do? He could use this money to provide a tax-free death benefit. We call it life insurance. It's tax-free under 101. The new tax proposals don't talk about taxing that at all. So put it into graphic form. Essentially, you can review it, but if he had the misfortune of getting, uh, saving all this money, retiring at 65, that's the red. So, you know, uh, no matter which one of the ones, um, whether it was a capital asset or a bank account and bonds, um, he's still, you know, gonna get less than um, $500,000. It uh, just hasn't time to grow, whereas he gets a million dollars if it's life insurance. I showed you the life expectancy ones. That's the gray one. What if he has the good fortune to make it all the way out to 100? You know, life expectancy is just half of where people go. People live past it. What if he made it out to age 100? Well, if he paid as you go, you're basically looking at, oh, I don't know, $140,000. I'm sorry, $1,400,000 or so. If he gets the step up in basis gift, he does really well. Okay, it's over two hundred, uh, it's over two million dollars he gets. So there's a real advantage if at age fifty and then he dies fifty years later, that tax makes a big difference. But again, if you um, start taxing that at death, those numbers go down. It's still big, and so there's still an advantage to having a capital asset versus just putting it in savings, but if you uh, tax it at the full 43.4, it goes down more. So you get a million dollars either way with the life insurance. So where am I going with this? Well, you really kind of have to take the capital asset idea out there. You're, you're saving $14,600 a year. This is really saving money. And so, yeah, some of it could go in mutual funds. And so some of it could be uh, subject to capital gains tax but it's not like you're just buying an asset and holding on to it. So that you really can kind of throw that out, which means you can also throw out the idea that it gets taxed at death because you know, you're gonna to have to pay some tax as you go along. 
Well, what about if you said, okay, forget about capital assets, but I could have put it in an IRA. True, you could have. But once you start uh, taking the money out, it's subject to tax. When do you start taking the money out? You don't take it at age uh, like life expectancy or at age 100. Remember, we have required minimum distributions. So you really can't do an apples to apples with that one either. So really what I'm talking about is for a lot of people, you're talking about some kind of savings where it might be 37% or some of it's capital gains. So it could be a little less. But if you look at it, you're really going to do better with the death benefit coming in tax-free at $1 million. And so I'm just trying to point to you why you might start thinking about this as, as an asset and not because of the cash phase, but because of the death benefit. Okay, so that's kind of a, a way to, to, to get it going. Um, let's, let's look at some specific ideas. And we're going to leave time for a question, so we should be okay. And the, the ideas that I want to get at, the point I want to make is I think there's a case for life insurance. If Tony's going to die sometime, well, he's going to die sometime. And if he really cares about what happens after he's gone, if he doesn't care, then the million dollars is not as important. But my point in bringing this up is it's more important than it was before because of those graphs I showed you because of tax rates. If they start taxing you at death, then suddenly the advantage of life insurance really escalates quite a bit. So that gets to what are the new ideas? What are the new life insurance strategies based on what we're hearing? And I have to just take a, a short digression here. My understanding from talking to Michael and Brandt is that uh, you've had Marty Shankman on um, these uh, sessions before. For those of you who don't know him, he is the estate planner to estate planners. Um, he's just this incredible machine that knows everything. Well, he made the greatest comment. I was on a webinar with him. Um, it was a collaborative one for uh, national estate planning councils. And he, he made a comment that just cracked me up. This was last week. He said, I tell you what, if these tax changes go through, I'm going to give up my life insurance. I'm sorry, I'm going to give up my law license and I'm going to get a life insurance license because there is just too much, too great uh, things that are going to happen with life insurance. I'm not saying that Marty Shankman has <laughs> said that. So it's kind of exciting to see what could happen, even though new, you know, more taxes is bad news. <laughs> Okay, so what happens? Why, why all these opportunities? Well, one is, come on, to, to fund the federal estate tax. If it suddenly goes from 11.7 million exemption where it is now to three and a half million, suddenly you have a flood of affluent clients it applies to. And even bigger is this monster issue of if you have to fund first death income taxes, essentially a step up in basis and a tax, Wow, those are huge because remember, we're talking about monster <laughs> rates at you know potentially over 40%. And now those are caution ones because I'm not saying that's where the law is. We do have some that are already, let's do it, let's move on this already that are you know, green, you know, um, meaning like um, using life insurance in lieu of stretch IRAs. Stretch IRAs for most situations are out. And so the idea of using life insurance as an alternative, which we'll talk about here shortly, is a great idea. Well, the natural um, consequence of this is it'll, uh, the need for life insurance will increase for executives because executives are going to say, I want that life insurance, but I want to pay for it on a tax efficient basis. So the principals of the world who can do all the cool things in the reporting with not only 162 bonus, but uh, split dollar, split dollar really ought to take off because you can get it to them on a tax efficient basis. Um, and similarly for funding uh, business transfers. So now if the idea is my business is my uh, retirement or my business is uh, what I'm gonna pass on to my family, well, suddenly you're gonna need to fund that. And if you have these big monster taxes coming in, then life insurance already makes a lot of sense, but it's going to make more sense because it's a tax free and it pays exactly when you need it. Now, another one is 
Um, and I bet you, Brian, this is going to keep you busy. Uh, I believe in the last seminar, uh, they asked you to explain private split dollar, uh, you know, and you, you were able to do it in, in two minutes um, when it really needs two hours. But um, concepts like private split dollar and generational split dollar will come back as, as bigger issues because we're going to have lower exemptions and particularly if you can only give $30,000 a year to fund a trust, you're really going to have to start looking at these concepts. And for those of you that are more into the nitty gritty of, of life insurance, we had a, a favorable ruling, even though it didn't work out so well for the actual petitioner, was the Morissette 2 case, which basically gave us a way to work with generational split dollar on a favorable basis. I'm not going to get into how you do that, but I'm just saying these are concepts that pay for life insurance on a very efficient tax basis. And then remember, the other thing is um, you've sold um, insurance in the past. And so maybe taking some of these policies that are sitting individually owned because you didn't think a federal estate tax would apply, and now you say it will if, if this tax law goes through, is gifting of enforced uh, policies. But you're going to want to be very careful with that because of uh, 1035, the, the, the three-year rule and that kind of stuff. But where I'm going with that is these are some of the new opportunities, some of the things that make attorney Marty Shankman suddenly say, maybe I should give this up and get into the life insurance business because of the great opportunities. So um, what I want to do with the remainder of the time is I run a retirement center, as Brandt said, at, at the American College. And so I deal a lot with retirement issues. And so I want to focus on uh, death benefit and life insurance, but as, as it relates to retirement, I want to bet for the client, not against them. You know, you don't always have to drive up to Hearst to show them the benefits of life insurance. So very quickly, think of the risks that you have at retirement. It's not like you get to retirement and oh, all the financial risks go away. You still could have all the risks from a, a bad health event, long-term care event, a sequence of return. I really worry about that right now because we're sitting on this just incredibly hot market. Well, if it goes down like it did in uh, 2008, maybe it doesn't have to go that much, that you get a bad sequence of return because you're sitting on a big 401k account and suddenly your two million became a million five. That's, that's an issue at retirement. Um, we have all this also this issue of inflation, which suddenly is uh, on our mind we have the risk of public policy. What's that mean? It basically means they might increase our taxes, what I've been talking about, or it's more subtle things like um, do even more means testing of Medicare. It's already means tested. Um, we're seeing forced retirements where people say, maybe Tony says, oh, gee, I was an executive, but I got, because of COVID, I was forced out into retirement quicker than I thought. Or even if you made it to retirement, what if your kids did and you have an unexpected financial responsibility where you want to help them out? All these things can happen in retirement. And the risk you have is you could live too long and run out of money. You could die too soon and need money now. So that's where I want to go with next is the whole idea of these retirement risks and where can the death benefit of life insurance help? I'm not talking about the cash value today, but really the death benefit. Well, think of some of the, some of the big ones. Um, clearly loss of spouse. If you have, if Tony died shortly after hitting retirement, that is a big financial hit to his spouse. Um, he may still be bringing in some money. You know, he may be still contributing to a 401k. His, um, he may still make some wages off his business that could um, fire his social security up more. And you have liquidity events. So you have all these individual needs. And when the first spouse dies, you know, you've got uh, all the burial expenses, but also the other expenses that pop up and they tend to pop up early in retirement. You have business needs. So maybe the business is what's funding the retirement and having somebody like Tony suddenly check out of the picture and his spouse only being there suddenly means you've got to, um, you've got to facilitate a buyout. And then all the taxes. Um, and I mean, not just the taxes that pop up at death, but um, for example, Tony's spouse would no longer be able to use uh, married filing jointly. There's all these other taxes that can pop up. Another one is the legacy. Most people, when they retire, most people want to leave a legacy, either to their children or to charity. And so that becomes a liquidity issue if, if they die. 
Um, and as I said, market fluctuations, a big one and the cash flow that comes from that, if you were going to take out four and a half percent, if you know the four and a half percent rule in retirement, and it was going to be on $2 million and suddenly you have sequence of return, and it goes down to a million five and you die, well, that's going to affect what your loved ones are going to get. And then you have unexpected taxes, which is exactly what we're talking about today. Um, my my co-director at the American College, um, Wade Fow, many of you are familiar with some of his writing. Um, he, he calls life insurance a volatility buffer. It's really something that's there to deal with the crazy things that can happen in retirement, whether you're still alive or die, um, because it's, it's not correlated to the market. And then finally, the idea of timing. You don't know when it's going to happen. That's the biggest unknown. Well, what I want to do and I'm still good on time, but I better move along, is I want to cover three of these, the legacy idea, the business idea, and the timing idea. The legacy idea, I just want to point out that starting next year, we have these new life expectancy tables, and you don't have to start taking required minimum distributions till age 72. So they kick in next year. And so the effect is that they are going to require a lower required minimum distribution each year, which means if you're taking out less, you're gonna have more balance. So, so to the owner, good news. And I actually, uh, I'm not gonna go through this in detail, but I looked and said, what if you had a 70 year old and I intentionally did this last year and you didn't have a secure act and you didn't have these new rates, well, they go into retirement at uh, 70 and they have $2 million and they die 10 years later. Well, they had to take RMDs. They would have their $2 million would leave a, a balance for the beneficiaries of 1.2 million. But now that person doesn't have to take it until 72 and you're using these lower rates. And so you have $2 million and they die uh, 10 years later. Well, now they have 1.4 million instead of 1.2 million. And so they have good news, $11 million. So why wouldn't you do that? Well, I think there are some whys because look at the beneficiary. Now we have under the SECURE Act, this 10 year rule. And so remember if, if somebody's gonna die, like in this example, in, at age 80, the, the children are probably adults and uh, might have their own income tax issues. And so you're looking at something like um, they're going to have my, higher marginal taxes because they can't do the stretch IRA. It's going to increase the threshold so their Part B Medicare goes up, all those kind of things. They're going to have less chance for it to accumulate because it's 10 years, not their lifetime. And so it messes up planning. The cash flows are off. If these people have creditor issues, it's just going to accelerate those issues. So what do we need to do at the planning level? We're at the green light stage. We're not, this isn't caution. So you really need to see if it fits your client and start talking through them about what are your legacy goals versus your retirement goals. And be sure to tr check trust language because some of these have been set up with trusts that as you know, Brian, um, are really ticking time bombs because they could end up causing you, the beneficiary, to not even get any of your inherited IRAs until 10 years after the, um, your parent dies. If you're wondering how that works, we can talk about that later. So you want to review all that and, and review your beneficiary language because maybe you want to leave it to your spouse because he or she can still get stretch IRA and then it's a 10-year rule. But my point in all this is you factor in the tax impact, not only on the owner, but on the beneficiary. And I think you start seeing that things like conversions to Roth and life insurance, that's the way to go. So I know I've shown this to this group in the past. It's based on an academic article I did six years ago. And I was pushing the idea of using life insurance as an alternative to required minimum distributions. Well, I thought it was a good idea back then. I think it's a really good idea now because um, it's an old strategy, but it makes so much more sense because you can't do the stretch IRA. So I'm not going through the numbers, but essentially the pale green is buying a $2 million policy from Principal Financial. Um, and basically you'd get that whether you died at age 68 or at age 87 versus just leaving it in the IRA, IRA strategy where at first you're not gonna get much more than 700,000 and even at age uh, 87, um, you're, you're better to do life insurance. 
So life insurance is the alternative where stretching is out and tax-free bequest is in. And all I'm saying is you could start drawing down from your IRAs to pay the premium. It helps the uh, donor spread it out, the tax, and helps the beneficiary because they, they get a known inheritance. Well, uh, there's lots of ideas for this. And so I just want to point out, this is why uh, BUI can help you so much. Uh, Brian sent this to me, Brian Siegel, for those of you who don't know. Hello, him. this is Sarah. Hello. Okay, we'll keep going. Um, so um, this is the kind of stuff that BUI uh, can do. This is taking that idea I was talking about in an IRA uh, maximization, because there's lots of things you could do. You could start the premiums before, you could actually use your RMDs to pay the premium. Maybe the legacy is not the kids, but a charity. So you could use qualified charitable distributions for the life insurance. Or I was pointing out, you could even use a survivorship policy. And I, I just point that out because this is why you want to talk to, uh, to the Brian's of the world. He's a tax attorney that's used to dealing with this because you look and go, maybe you should put it in survivorship because it's a lower premium, meaning it, it pays in the second death you could essentially do a stretch IRA for the surviving spouse, get a marital deduction and then pay out. Um, but you gotta be married and stay married. Uh, when you look at the numbers, the present value is the same, whether it's individual or um, joint or survivor, because um, you, don't, you have to wait for the second to death and it, it might not work out from a tax standpoint. So I just wanna point out, this really takes that concept, makes it better. The second one I want to mention is look at the tax proposals and how they threaten business succession. So essentially, one thing is if you pay more tax as a business owner, if Tony pays more tax, you have less profit and that affects his valuation. But also these higher estate and gift taxes make the succession of that business to his family tougher because you have a new creditor called the IRS. And um, the other one that just scares the heck out of me is these estate and gift tax tools I talked about, like valuation discounts and grants and idgets that they could kind of surreptitiously take away from this, even if they don't change the tax uh, exemptions. And that takes away so many of the tax planning tools that a business owner would have. And then of course the carryover of basis, if you have to pay taxes, at death, that's an existential liquidity issue because right when you've lost the founder of the business is right when the IRS nine months later says uh, pay up. And then you have just the uncertain timing as you don't know when this is all gonna happen. So this is an oldie, but a goodie. And this is from Principal Financial. Um, they have been using this for years, but now this concept really has legs. They call it the, the no sell, buy, sell. What you're doing is you don't formally do a buy-sell agreement because you don't know where you stand yet. And instead, you you fund it with life insurance. So you set up this tax-free death benefit for financing the deal. So what do you have? What You don't know what's going to happen when Tony dies. So maybe uh, there are uh, additional income taxes and estate taxes so that life insurance is needed to pay that. Maybe his surviving spouse needs income continuation. So you have liquid tax-free dollars for that. Maybe you need this to make some of these um, business transactions work like a stay bonus to keep a key person from leaving even though Tony died. Or maybe you realize that rather than your kids who went off to uh, play at an ashram, you really need a key uh, employee to buy the business, but that key employee doesn't have any money. Well, they have money if you have this life insurance that you could lend to them. So you see the idea. Um, it's there's no tricks to it. You're basically paying premiums for life insurance. You would typically put this in an irrevocable life insurance trust and have the wording to allow the uh, trust to buy assets from the estate to lend money to the estate uh, to use for income continuation, that kind of stuff. So at death, it could go to family as needed. It could be used to buy out owner uh, business interests. It's, it's a wait and see, buy, sell. I love it. And it just makes so much sense right now. And let me give you one more um, concept and then we'll, uh, we'll leave uh, some time for questions. Um, I just wanna point out timing. You know, life insurance is usually bought for three reasons. Either you love someone, you owe someone or for profit. 
And so let's say that Tony loves someone and that's um, his spouse and his kids and he wants them to, to be taken care of if he's not, or not around. He may owe somebody because it's called the IRS and these new taxes, but he thinks in terms of profit, he wants return on it. So I'm not gonna go through this slide, but my point is he's putting that 14.6 away and he could either just invest it and pay his tax or he could buy life insurance. And the life insurance, of course, is a guaranteed one at 3.75 that he's going to get that's going to pay. Well, normally you show this idea, right? Well, if you if you die uh, when you're young, you're going to get a million dollars of life insurance, whereas in the investment you aren't. And basically the break point, the point at which the investment um, starts doing better than the life insurance is out past life expectancy, whoops, sorry, at um, 83. Well, Think about it in terms of internal rate of return. Look at it this way. Life insurance really pushes the dollars up front because if you die, let's say you die the year after you get this, you know, 51, you know, 6,700% internal rate of return. You don't want that because you're dead. But I mean, even as you approach retirement, you get a 17% internal rate of return. But I want to bet for you. So you retire. Well, even there, you're doing okay because if you die shortly after retirement, you're getting 15, 16% internal rate of return. And even if you make it all the way out to 100, you still get a positive return. And it starts, starts looking at around age 83. But really, it's not 83 because this was tax neutral. The fact is, life insurance is tax free. And especially if we're going to start taxing that 3.7% return. Um, at a higher rate, really the break point's gonna be closer to age 90 that you're going to have that effect. So I said big mistake versus a little mistake. The big mistake is you die early in retirement. You don't have liquidity to pay spousal income. You don't have the liquidity to pay for additional taxes. That's a big mistake. A little mistake is you have the good fortune to make it to 100 and you only got a 1% positive return on your life insurance, whereas you might have on a non-guaranteed basis gotten 3.75. So let me just kind of leave it with this thought is this tends to happen, the need tends to happen early in retirement. Um, you still might be getting income and that suddenly gets cut off um, because Tony's gone and can't contribute anymore. You have a sequence return because his, um, that's when he has the biggest uh, capital balance on his retirement and your expenses go up. Kids might still be getting tuition. You might still have a mortgage. But the other thing I can tell you from the American college is people retire on a go-go basis in the early years, a slow go when they start slowing down in their seventies and eighties and a no go when they really become elderly. Your spending patterns are higher in the early years. And so that is when you need your high rate of return. So you're with life insurance, it's a reverse IRR solution and please come up with a better name than I just did. I only came up with this recently, but you're replacing income. You're offsetting those early expenses at the go-go years and you have a non-correlated asset so that if we have a market correction, you've got this uncorrelated asset there. All I wanna point out and, and then one last thing is you add these additional taxes and it makes this concept even more important because now if you're talking about higher income taxes at death, it just makes it all the more important. And we already, because of SECURE Act, know we're gonna have higher taxes for beneficiaries because they have to take it in 10 years, not in life expectancy. And suddenly our old nemesis, the transfer tax may come back to haunt the Tonys of the world that before only really applied to the rich. So one last thought, and then um, Brant, we can open it up for questions, but um, I just want to leave you with this thought. Stay aware of this stuff because the, the estate planning attorneys, a lot of them are pre-funding their, uh, their eyelets right now. And so don't miss the gift that uh, keeps on giving of getting money pre-funded to eyelets. Be aware that you're going to see more business sales. We're already seeing some of this where they're trying to get that lower cap gain. Um, you might have the attorney say, we're going to be setting up a grant or trust. Know about some of these things because they're going on. Be careful what you offer because if you transfer a current policy, you have the three-year rule. And so you want to make sure that the, you make them aware of that. And the other thing is 
attorneys are not available right now. <laughs> they are so busy that be careful not to promise something that you can't deliver on it. That's just a friendly recommendation. And, and you know, make choices um, versus recommendations because you do not want the liability of saying this is what you should do and Congress goes a different way. Even the attorneys are not making recommendations, they're offering choices. So the bottom, and document all of this, obviously. The bottom line is these are dangerous times. They really, really are where it's fraught with opportunities but liabilities. So you wanna work with the pros and obviously the pros you could be working with are BUI, Brian Siegel. This makes so much more sense right now. I have never experienced this kind of a tax environment. So how about that? Do you want me to repeat all this or should we go ahead with questions? <laughs> Uh, excellent presentation, Steve. As always, thank you so much. We do have a number of questions. Before getting there, just want to remind everybody to make sure that you sign in for CE. You do it through the chat feature of this uh, of the webinar. Uh, we are pretty low in terms of uh, the ratio of CE uh, requests to attendees. So please, if you want credit, make sure you complete that. So Steve, um, I'm going to start out with a question that, that you hit just right at the end. You mentioned uh, difficulty in accessing estate planning attorneys. And that actually was one of the questions um, from, I'm not sure where the advisor is located, but that they're having difficulty getting clients into estate planning attorneys in their area. Is that widespread? And uh, are you finding that attorneys are actively reaching out to clients about these needs to plans? Or is this something where it really needs to generate from the financial service professional? Uh, great questions. First of all, the, the first one's easy. Yes, it is nationwide. Um, I'm involved in the National Association of, of the State uh, Planning Councils. It's crazy. And so it's just reality. Deal with it. In other words, get started on this now. And it's a good reason, by the way, to get your clients going. In other words, look, I'm available, but your attorney may not be. Let's start now. Um, as far as the um, letting them know, interestingly, attorneys hate to send out those letters because that then puts them on the hook from a fiduciary standpoint. If they say, be aware, these tax laws are coming, they're worried about it. But what's going on? The Martin Shankmans of the world and the um, Sarah Glazers of the world, it's floating all over the internet right now is letters. So yes, figure that estate planning attorneys the in thing to do is they are sending letters as we speak, making them aware of this kind of stuff. So one, <laughs> start doing it yourself uh, because you don't want to be behind the eight ball and have you know someone say, hey, I was talking to my attorney and said, you didn't tell me about this. So yes, um, but the attorneys are doing it too, which is different. Normally you're the one that has to uh, make the uh, client aware. Now everybody's trying to make the client aware. Got it. So the attorneys are backed up. So Start scheduling now while you can. Uh, Steve, uh, can Steve elaborate on how islets could be impacted by new potential lift, uh, potential limitations coming to the annual gift exclusion? Yes. So what's going on is uh, in the Sanders bill, they talked about maxing out the annual exclusion to $30,000. So bottom line is if the premium to fund the islet is more than $30,000, you got a problem because um, you, know, you can use a crummy provision to take care of the 30,000, but if you have a $100,000 premium, you have to start getting fancy and using the five and five and a lot of different um, concepts. That's why I said, and I'll leave it to Brian, to, I mean, you can follow up with him and he can talk about it, but concepts like private split dollar where essentially you're lending the premium instead of giving the premium are gonna be big. Uh, maybe using generational skip, uh, generational split dollar. These ideas were here before, but now because you might have a limit of only thirty thousand dollars total, uh, suddenly you're going to have to start thinking of creative ways. Or otherwise, part of that death benefit is in the estate, and that obviously defeats the purpose. Got it. And and I'm glad you noted, Brian. If anybody's watching uh, this this webinar and thinking, "Wow, I wish I had." some sort of legislative update I could provide to my clients. Uh, because of your relationship with BUI, you do have access to that. Uh, reach out to any of your carrier uh, or any of your uh, friends at BUI and we'll help you get that set up. Uh, Brian's done it before for clients um, and we're happy to do that. Um, so expanding on what you just mentioned, can you, ex can you explain private split dollar 
Is it loaning money to a trust to fund a life insurance policy so you're not using your gifting exemption? Essentially, yes. What you're doing is you're lending it to them. And so you're not, um, so you're, you've only gifted a small, only a small part of it is treated as a gift. The rest is a loan. And so you're going to need to get some of that money back um, when the person dies, when the insured dies. Um, the one thing you need to be aware of is you need some kind of an exit plan because when you start getting at 100, um, the costs on that get uh, prohibitive. And that's where you're going to want to set up a grat. So it gets um, complex. And by the way, an aspect of that is first, you work with BUI and the Brian's of the world, so you kind of understand it yourself. Second, I would be very careful about saying, oh, the estate planning attorney is not there. So I'm going to work with the attorney who does their divorce work and criminal work <laughs> because this is not this is not amateur hour. You really need sophisticated uh, documentation on this. It has to be in conjunction with an estate planning attorney. I hope you agree, Brian. Well, hopefully the client doesn't have a criminal attorney. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we definitely follow you there. So uh, do you suggest that a high net worth clients consider using their lifetime gifting exemption since it's scheduled to decrease in 2026? A lot of us are saying, yes, that seems to be the appropriate thing to do. The one thing is that's really hanging out there is this, they keep calling it the Van Halen Amendment that would take it back to January 1 of this year. So what, the, what I'm saying, what Marty Shankman is saying is that probably is a good idea. However, in presenting it to the client, present it to them as an option. In other words, let them know that that can make a lot of sense because the Democrats may wait and just say, well, wait until 2026 uh, when the exemption goes down anyway, but you might as well start moving that money out now. But the trouble is, what if? What if this is retro, then you accelerate their taxes? So do I think that's a good idea in the right situation? Yes, I do. But I always present it to the client as one of the options, not as your recommendation. Got it. So if not now, before 2026 is at least a, a choice to mm -hmm. provide to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then we'll finish here with, this is a, I got different variations of this one, but um, as it relates to the loss of basis, uh, stepped up basis, and particularly with business owners, um, that basis may not be very easy to identify. What steps can be taken in your mind for a business owner to kind of plan for being able to identify basis at, at their, uh, or to have their estate identify their basis at their death? Like, you know, what, what should they be thinking and doing and uh, documenting now? Well, pardon a short digression, but when this first happened during the Carter administration, I'm old enough to remember it, what we all did is got the December 31st issue of Wall Street Journal and put it in plastic wrappers. I'm not making that up because that gave us stock prices. Um, what's going to happen is um, not only do you need to work with the attorney, but you're going to need to work with the accountant. I am telling you, as somebody who's been in the business almost 45 years, that basis is a bear to, to um, track. And I don't have a good answer, but I think what you do need to do is business owners are gonna have to be more thorough in working with their attorneys, I'm sorry, to work with their accountants on documenting this because I don't have an easy answer. Um, basis is very difficult to, to track, but what I would be doing is if I'm doing improvements on my business, you want that stuff and you want it in some kind of file that you can that you can essentially track as before, who cared? It just stepped up uh, date of death. Now you may need to be able to document it much like selling your house and any uh, capital gain inside your house. You gotta be able to show the IRS the documentation of that. It's gonna be tough. Yeah, absolutely. Well, Steve, just another excellent presentation. We're so grateful for your participation. Uh, and again, a big thank you to Principal for sponsoring our event today. Um, last chance for everyone, make sure you sign in for CE. And as I said, I will be sure to uh, send out a recording uh, of the presentation before the end of the week. Uh, to all of you, thank you so much for your continued support and partnership with BUI. And enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you.